Hello, uh, so welcome to one of my videos again. Uh, you might remember me from An Englishman in Kiev, uh, Bucharest Nightlife, which was sadly taken down by YouTube because it invaded someone's privacy, and uh, many other videos. Thanks for watching those, by the way. Uh, today, I'm off to, uh, well, I'm flying to Toulouse, and I'm gonna get a, and then I'm gonna drive from Toulouse to uh, a family house, and then from the family house, we're gonna, I'm gonna go visit a, the camera just stopped there. I no, I'm still recording. Then I'm going to go visit a uh, little seaside town on the, in the southwest of France, on the, yeah, by the Mediterranean, on the, near the Spanish border, called Coulier. Um, I've just been, I'm going to be there for two days. Some might say that's the perfect sort of amount of time to visit Coulier. So I'm going to take you on that journey, see what Coulier is like, and uh, let's see if we can have a good time. Responsibility. Want to switch seats? No, I'm not sure I'm the man for that particular job. An exit door procedure at 30,000 feet. Mm hmm. Illusion of safety. Yeah. Hey, so I've arrived uh, late in Toulouse and. Uh, Planning now is to get picked up, hopefully, and then tomorrow morning I will make my way to the coast. So this is where I stayed for the night, uh, this little French house here. I'm now going to get in the car and head on to Coulier. Uh, the weather was hot when I arrived last night, it's a bit cooler today, so I'm hoping when, by the time I get to the coast, it's uh, nice and hot. Hey, so here I am. I'm in uh, Coulet. Just uh, got to my uh, apartment, three bedroom apartment actually. Uh, and there's a slight ruse to this. Um, usually I'm found uh, traveling alone, uh, but today I'm actually traveling with my sister and two aunts and my mother and father. Reason being, it's my mother and father's 40th wedding anniversary. 40 years, can you imagine that? Being with the same person, 40 years. Well done to them, that's what I say. Well done, well done to them. Um, they're just parking up the car, uh, just over here. I think. And it uh, gives me a chance to sort of explore Coulier. Now this is a place I have been to a few times and that's possibly the reason that this place was picked for the 40th wedding anniversary celebrations. And, uh, well, hoping to basically show you what Coulier is like, so enjoy. Enjoy this uh, journey.
so I obviously made it Kulia. This is one of the beaches in Kulia. Um, a little bit stony. Uh, a lot of the beaches are around here, but it's still very picturesque and very beautiful. Um, old castle, old fort behind me. People enjoying the, enjoying, enjoying the water. It is incredibly warm here right now. And me, pasty me, um, I have to have my hat on keep, to stop myself burning. I'm just walking along the um, castle walls, um, the Chateau Royal. Um, basically, this part of France is on the border of the Pyrenees. It wasn't actually France until the 17th century when it was taken by the French and basically, well, because it's a strategic point, as you can see, great place to have a fort, a fort over there. And it just uh, it made sense for the people to have this uh, uh, strategic point. So they could sail their ships safely away from the Spanish coast, which is, the Spanish coast is well, effectively just that way, as south. And uh, this was a sort of one of the first key points before, you know, in the Mediterranean, before you got to Spain. And uh, battles were fought here. The uh, Foreign Legion still have a division here. You often see them uh, riding up and down this sort of uh, piers. I, I don't know if I'll see them today. But I'm certainly going to look out for them, and if I see them, I'm going to record them. So let's hope. I will break you, then remake you. Now the fighter must become a soldier. This is the Legion! You march, or you die! And these are my knights of the round table. Whose castle is this? Can we come up and have a look? Of course not. You are English types. Well, what are you then? I'm French. Why do you think I have this outrageous accent, you silly king? It's suddenly got a lot colder down here. It's about 32 degrees outside, and inside it feels like a sort of a, kind of a cold cellar, except it feels like I'm in the basement, but right now I'm a, probably, I'm probably at least on the first floor. Uh, you, in the US, that, that's the second floor in the US, but in the, in the UK and Europe, the first floor is the floor above the ground floor. Bit of a maze. Look at this, the archers would have lent out there trying their best to defend. Not much of a view out there, but you know, hopefully it was never used, but I'm sure it was. 
There was a known fort to be here ever since the Romans. Uh, and just sort of reading on the thing, the 500 years BC, the Greek navigators used to frequent the trading posts of Nkulia, which became the port, the port of Elne, the seat of the bishop from the 6th century onwards. The name Kulia comes from Kako Liburius, or meaning the conch, you know, the conch. Actually, the conch is the way to say it, conch. Remember Lord of the Flies? Piggy would uh, suddenly gain power when he had the conch. Uh, when he didn't have the conch, he was at the mercy of all of the, the rabble of schoolboys. Anyway, let's continue this tour. The first mention of this fortified site at Coulier was in the 7th century. Because there's a spotlight here. See that sort of spotlight lighting up the display of the sort of Archer's Tower at Torres. I'll sort of give you a little bit of a rendition on what sort of uh, the sort of the history of this place. Uh, in the 12th century, um, Gerard, the last independent count of the Rosaline, bequeathed his lands to the apostle Alfonso II, King of Aragon and the Count of Barcelona. And you wonder where the Lord of the Rings uh, author gets the name names from. He just looks at the history books and he, he finds names like Aragon. Uh, it wasn't remind me, remind me. It wasn't uh, the Hobbit. Didn't the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, the Finch and Aragon as well? I think it did. Anyway, in the 13th century, the Chateau Royal was annexed to the Kingdom of Marjorac, which included the domain of Montpellier, the Eldams of the Rosaline and the Cardigan, and the Confident of Vlaspera of the Balearic Islands. That's like Bifa to you and I. In the 16th century, after a brief occupation by Louis X and the Spanish Habsburg, starting with Charles Quint, again occupied Coulier. And then in the 17th century, as I mentioned earlier, Coulier was, was the stake in the wars between the Spanish Habsburgs and the French Bourbons. In 1659, France annexed the Rousseline and Coulier, and the castle passed indefinitely, or definitively, into the French hands. So, and ever since then, since 1642, this has been French. And what a beautiful, beautiful castle. Let's explore some more. looking at the map of this place, I'm standing in what is now known as the parade ground. And yes, I'm going to refer to my plastic notes, which I picked up. Always pick up your notes. Uh, it was created in the 15th century, this parade ground, although some of the buildings clearly behind me, inside the inner castle walls, are obviously more modern. Definitely been renovation. And as you can see, there is still renovation going on, just to make this place even more beautiful. I'm going to climb the steps now, see what the view's like. Sadly, there's a Catalan flag up there, which is good. There's a French flag up there. And then there's the European Union flag up there. I guess they've injected some money into the place. They do have positives. They do have some positives about them. What I love about uh, walking along these uh, old castle walls is it just sort of 
I don't know if you shut your eyes and you can't tell I'm not shutting my eyes because I've got sunglasses on. Um, you could imagine soldiers lined up here, ready, poised for battle. There might be someone pouring hot molten anything off the top, you know, when people are trying to get up at the ladders. Battles took place here. This place was over, overrun multiple times. So a lot of people would have lost their lives here and a lot of arrows would have been shot from the fortifications. And you can imagine sword fights taking place just here. Obviously this wall is a little bit nearer than what it, what it was back then. You can imagine there was no wall back then and there certainly wasn't a metal railing. But this wall was here. So what you basically see was effectively here. This med these medieval walls effectively existed since the 13th century. And before that, there was a fortification, you know, possibly wood. Roman fortifications before. And the Greeks talked about it, you know, in the 5th century BC as a strategic point. And it's just amazing to think what has gone on here, the history that's sort of involved. So, I mean, you know, it might look, look like a load of old rubble, but you've got to realize civilization, Western civilization that we know, started blossomed in this part of the world and if it wasn't for the battles that took place here we wouldn't have the west that we know now blood for france go it'll make a fine pin cushion Remember the Dubrovnik video? Castle walls are crowded. This is very, very beautiful. This is the uh, top of the castle. Inside, looking down, there's the under construction sort of still going on. Well, not under construction, the sort of renovations. But you can smell just, just the ancientness of the wood here. Two broadsides to hurl one. You want to see a guillotine in Piccadilly? No! You want to call that raggedy ass Napoleon your king? No! You want your children to sing the Marseillaise? No! Mr. Mort, Mr. Pulling, starboard battery! Yes,
so that was the Chateau Royale. Uh, hopefully you saw some of what I saw there. Um, four euros to get in. There was a maritime ex ex exhibition in regards to films set around the sea. Um, I took some videos of some of the posters. The one I found the most amusing was the French film where the, the man's leaning up against a, a wall, not dissimilar to this, but the wall is shaped like a penis. Um, I hopefully you noticed that. I, I think it's that was obviously intentional. Um, but would I, how would I rate it? I would give it probably eight out of ten, simply for the fact that it's four euros in this part of the world. That's not that's not a bad price. So displays were limiting. Uh, you need to be able to speak French. Everything was in French. It was, uh, it was, uh, had a um, what do I have? I had a plastic card that was in English, but it only gave us a brief description on sort of the history. All of the placards were in French. Um, use your Google Translator, point your phone at the wall and it will translate for you. But it does make it problematic if, you, if your French is not scratch. Mine's okay, not the best though. some air into it. Oxygenating it opens it up. It unlocks the aromas, the flavors. Very important. Smell again. Oh, that's what you do with every one of them. Wow. When do we drink it now? Mm. One thing that's very noticeable about this place, uh, especially if you're a frequenter of uh, the sort of more noisy places of France, if, if you head down to Saint-Tropez or, or sort of Nice or anywhere of these places, very, very busy, a lot of people selling tourist tax. Uh, here, other than the sort of quaint little shops, uh, there's no tourist tax, it's, it's beautiful. Um, the clientele that frequent this place, generally the sort of the older, the older sort of person, a lot of little old ladies and old men with their dogs. Probably why my parents like the place actually. I mean, they're both in there, they're both 64. <laughs> So, just had a beer on the um, front, as you can see. A lot of chairs along the front. What I didn't realize was this tiered pricing. So basically, when you sit closer to the front, which is exactly what I did, it's a different price to those at the back. Or at least that's what I'm told anyway, after I've already paid. Uh, correct me if that's not true, but uh, five euros for a beer, not that cheap. But uh, it's certainly cheaper than Ibiza.
one side of this cove, extremely wavy. And then as we turn all the way around, sandy beaches. There's a little church up here. I don't know if you can hear me because it's it is windy. Hear me because of the wind, but um, this is pretty much the end of the pier. Coolia is all behind me. This is Coolia. Very, very, very beautiful little place. I'm just sort of walking around sort of uh, little alleyways which involves walking up hills as you can see a lot of artists live around here um, what's surprising is it was so windy the top of the peak where there's a cross of Jesus Basically a series of lots and lots of little cobble streets, as you can see right behind me. The beautiful flowers sort of draping from the sides of the buildings, shutters painted everywhere. It's a very picturesque kind of place. Um, one place you could, you could certainly get lost in for a few hours, if not a, if not a weekend like I'm here. So the first dinner of the festivities, the sun is about to set. Look at this beautiful, beautiful place. Oh, they do tapas as well. Q as in Q Gardens. As in Q, yes. Like near, Rich near Richmond. So um, because we're so close to the Spanish border, we got this uh, sangria. Catalo basically older Catalonia. They want to split from Spain. Look at this, like a bent spoon. You got pictures all over the place. There we go, it's nice. Look at that sunshine. I'm here in Coolia. 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 Say chowder. Chowder. I'm here with my um, little sister and her, my brother in law. Impressions? The cheddar's daughter. No impressions? I just did you uh, yeah. make a quimby. But there was one piece of ravioli. <laughs> that was that was that. Are you sure you got the right one? Anyway, so he and I said we could have a job. Uh, Save it to us.
Merci au français. Ah oui, bien sûr. Pouvez-vous m'aider, s'il vous plaît Est-ce qu'il y a un hôtel ou pension quelconque par ici où je peux trouver une chambre <rire> Morning. So, had a good night last night. Uh, very good food down by the port in Coulia. Now I'm up. To be honest, it took a while to get up actually. Um, I'm now going to climb up this big hill to go to the Fort Saint Emilion, which is that uh, I think it's a monastery really. But uh, sort of a little bit more information as the walk uh, goes on. I have my big bottle of water. This uh, part of France is very well known for its rosé wine. Um, a lot of people think that's uh, white grapes mixed with red grapes, that's not true. Um, I'm not really going to go expand on the process, uh, but if you like rosé wine, Coulier, which is right there, great place to come for rosé wine. You can buy, if you go into the little sort of uh, wine shops that are sort of dotted around the sort of centre, uh, you can buy a litre of good rosé wine for about five to seven euros depending on which one you go for um, and they all taste really good uh, still continuing up on this walk but you know what a sight I'm at the moment I'm pretty much alone I've seen the odd I've seen a couple of tourists on the way back down and I've seen a lot of uh, triathlon runners they were earlier on they were swimming in the ocean um, and now they, they sort of seem to be running up this hill I think I may have seen the last of them though. Almighty God, we thank thee that thou hast vouchsafed to us the most holy. So I made it to the top. I'm at St. Uh, Elmail Fortress. Probably saying that wrong. Please correct me in the comments below. I know everyone normally does correct me. Um, so this is a fortress and I only needed that much water. So it really wasn't a difficult climb. It was, just, it was actually very, a lot shorter than I thought it would be. Um, let's go inside. Let's go check it out. Oh, just, to, just for your guide, just to, if you wanted to go inside this fortress, it will cost you five euros. Um, apparently I got a discount, I'm not sure what it would have been prior to getting the discount but the French girl was very, very smiley and she gave me a discount. Always nice, thank you. interesting about the uh, walls of this castle, or well, this fort really, uh, they're slanted which basically enabled uh, cannons to sort of, cannonballs to supposedly bounce off them. The sort of slant they would sort of ricochet off rather than sort of being indented in the walls. Uh, clever design um, because this fort was bombarded for years until it eventually fell. 
to the French and then the, Pyre the Pyrenees Aragon region became France. Let go! a king wandering around uh, inside the fort. Uh, it reminds me of that uh, the Pesh Mode video. Um, do you know it? I might splice it in here just now, just so you can remind yourselves. Words are very unnecessary They can only do one. I think I am one of three tourists in this whole place, which is nice. I like it when places are empty. You may have noticed that. Um, what's, um, what's apparently uh, one of the most common findings around here are bullets and bayonets apparently all over the where you see the vineyards behind. There's lots of bullets, lots of bayonets because this, this fort was under siege for a serious amount of time and obviously you know there's gonna be a lot of drop bullets but what an incredible place. You could imagine this would be not out of place in any Game of Thrones episode. Uh, incredible views. Okay, I'm gonna try and get to the top now. Hello. Ah, a bit of modern sofa, and a old castle. Looks like they're preparing for dinner here. Maybe this is why the king's here. Brutal. You do not want to get hit by that. One for all. All for one. And you wonder where ISIS get their inspiration from. Illustrating the sort of empire of Charles Quint. Um, literally, he had an empire expanding, I think it was five continents, as you can see. Impressive, eh? And he thought the British were the powerful ones. The French were equally as powerful in the 16th century. So, I made it up to the top of the roof and uh, I asked the king, I said, King, where's Techno? He goes, my son, I'll put some techno on for you. So what you hear in the background is the king playing techno. <laughs> I'm literally the only person here. I wanted some techno last night, couldn't find any. I had to come up all the way to the top of the, the highest castle in the land, or certainly around here, to find the techno. Not bad, eh? It's insanely beautiful though. Very, very beautiful. We 
you live here? I, I would live here. Just as I'm leaving, all the tourists arrive. How did they get up the hill? On the train. <laughs> it's amazing how lazy some people are. Just, I mean, just walk for God's sake. Um, it was a nice walk as well. However, I guess, I guess some people just like being very big. Is that harsh? No. Okay, so having walked all the way up to the top of the fort, obviously been inside the fort, seen a uh, kids party kicking off, little kids uh, dressed up as uh, princesses and kings, which is quite cute. I thought it'd be inappropriate to film that, uh, given that I'm a solo bloke, so best not film kids when you're, when you're a bloke on your own. Um, I then walked down the hill, and I now find myself in Port Vendre. It could be, could be, it could be called Vendre, or Vendre, I'm not sure. Uh, correct me once again in the comments. I'm sure you, someone's gonna slag me off for my pronunciation. Um, kind of not as pretty as Coulier, which is uh, slightly to the north of where we are right now. Um, this is one of the last ports before you get to Spain. Um, feels a little bit more industrial, um, but oh, there's, a, there's a church tower. I think it's I think it's three o'clock. Yeah, it's three o'clock. I'm uh, gonna go have a wander around, um, maybe have a beer, and then I'm gonna walk. I think it's about nine kilometres home, so I'm gonna walk that. Uh, a lot of walking today. I'll let you know how, at the end of the day how many steps I've done. See, this will trigger a few people. One flag I respect, the other I do not. The one I respect is this one, right here, the French flag. It's a beautiful flag. This one, the European Union, this is triggering right now, but I think it's a corrupt dictatorship that is going to pose havoc for the planet if it doesn't implode soon. Um, do not believe the propaganda they push upon you in your schools. Do not believe the propaganda they push upon you from the BBC and all the news networks. The European Union is run by unelected officials, dictating rules. It is not the free trade area that we had, that, that, that they let us believe it would be. It is nothing but the next step to one world government. 120 billion euros each year succumbs to corruption in the European Union's member states. The figure compares to the bloc's entire annual budget. EC Commissioner Cecilia Malmström says the extent of the problem is breathtaking. We cross live now to RT's Europe correspondent, Peter Oliver. Well, Peter, who comes out badly in the study? Hello. Well, everybody comes out of this looking a little bit um, shifty. What we have seen, though, is that the EU Commission, who 
put forward this report, uh, referring to corruption within the European Union as breathtaking. Now, upwards of 120 billion euros a year may have been done in, in uh, backhanded deals. Um, over half of the people in the European Union, half of the, over half of those who were surveyed, have said that um, they think that corruption within the Union was growing. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The title of this report is A Satirist's Dream, Closing the Gap between anti-corruption law and reality. I could fill my 60 seconds talking about the 18 years' worth of unaudited accounts or the bazillions that are squandered on uh, agriculture and foreign aid boondoggles or the Tillac case where instead of any of the alleged fraudsters being arrested, it was the journalist uh, trying to find out about them who found himself banged up by the police. I could talk about the 6.6 million pounds spent last year by European commissioners simply on entertainment and luxury gifts and hotels. I could talk about the uh, wonderful spectacle of President Van Rompuy and uh, Commissioner Ashton flying to the same meeting in Russia from in separate private jets leaving Brussels within four hours of each other. Instead, I'll confine myself to saying this. These things happen not because the EU attracts particularly bad people. I mean, of course, it attracts some bad people. Man is fallen, and like all institutions, it contains those who give in to temptation. It happens rather because there is no link between taxation, representation, and expenditure at Brussels level. It was Milton Friedman who said there's two kinds of money in the world. There's your money and there's my money. The trouble is that in the EU, it's all your money. Hence negligence, corruption, fraud, and what, uh, and what we see before us today. Once again, I'm not let down on one of my trips. I find an Obelix. What is it about Obelixes and every place in the world I go? Um, you would think we were in Egypt. Or you would think that most major cities, most major towns all over the world are connected via three masonry, Masonic sort of uh, symbolism through the, ob the Obelix. And the sort of if you're a conspiracy theorist, you might believe a sort of a shadow type presence. The reason there's an obelisk to be found in almost every single city in the world. Beautiful though, I like them. Uh, in, in Norway, uh, they have obelisks as gravestones. I, if I, when I die, I would like an obelisk as a gravestone. Maybe not as big as this, but a smaller one would suffice. Um, is this a grave or is this uh, something more sinister? Or am I just being slightly cynical? Let's find out, or maybe you decide. Um, I'll be honest, there wasn't much in Port Vendre. It was pleasant to have a glass of rosé, uh, some tapas, but that's all there is. Now I'm walking back to Coulier along the road. Less hills this time because the fort is up that way. It's walking along the sort of coast. Some five miles or so later, I would come back to my original destination, which is Coulier, which is just down there. So I guess another half a mile or so I can be back in Coulier. Um, incredible scenery. 
Um, not too much to really do other than a little bit of sightseeing, but it's very, very pleasant. And the temperature now is 33 degrees according to the last thermometer I walked past. Uh, incredible, incredible. It's just very, very pleasant. If you're here for a weekend, I highly recommend it. Way to describe this it sounds like a really strange EDM track. Apparently, they're gonna light a uh, fire, maybe some sort of celebration going on. Tell me what it's about. It's 23rd of June, apparently, this happens every year, but I have no idea what it's about. I need to Google it, obviously. Which fish? Brown, which fish is that? All right, so here we have pine needles on fire. It's extremely hot. Fireman is on guard, just in case it all sort of blows up in their face. Primer's going to put it out, but it's a sort of celebration of the sort of summer solstice is the best way to describe it. Look, at, look how red my nose is. Anyway, good times. Good times. Pistache? Oui.
that was my trip to Coulier. Um, possibly didn't film everything I should have filmed. Uh, there's some beautiful markets in Coulier. Uh, my camera stopped working, so you have to really visit it for yourself to check out the markets. Um, obviously, I didn't want to impose too much in terms of the dining experience. I filmed some of the food. I hope you appreciate that. The food was amazing. Um, but now heading off to the airport. Thanks for um, watching. Uh, if you like this video, uh, click subscribe, probably here or here. And um, yeah, check out this yacht. British yachts. Um, that's a big yacht. Um, so I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.